All right, so we will uh, get going. Welcome to the second day of uh, the course. We will be focusing on image segmentation today. Uh, we will be looking, we will be using Fiji for image segmentation, as well as the um, deep learning methods um, that we talked about yesterday, Salpos and Stardust. All right, so now this is for recording. Uh, we are recording over Zoom, so sorry for looking a bit funky. Okay, so you all know who we are, um, and you can always come and ask us questions. Totally fine by us. It's all free, and we have lots of different microscopes. All right, so goal of the segmentation is to create a mask of a desired object, uh, your nucleus, your cell membrane, and cytoplasm. Uh, and this is all based on the fluorescent, fluorescence label of your image, right? So again, kind of rehashing that when you are preparing or designing an experiment, you have to make sure that you have things that you may require to do image analysis in future. So something like this, you know, you need to have a nuclear label, for example, over here, either a plasma membrane label or a, so either a plasma membrane label or something uh, inside the cytoplasm that might be enough for you to segment your cell, right? That could be actin labeling. Um, and if you require something else within the cytoplasm to be segmented, let's say mitochondria or Golgi or ER or uh, vesicles such as uh, endosomes or lysosomes, right? And the eventual result is going to be a binarized object, which can be used uh, to measure various imaging parameters. And that's what we will be focusing on as well today. So you can start with your nice cell like this, segment uh, nucleus, segment cytoplasm, and boom. And tomorrow in cell profile, we will learn how to uh, subtract this from this um, to get just the cytoplasm. So today's workshop is to make sure that you are aware of some of the tools out there, all the open source tools, I should say, out there uh, for segmentation and analysis. Uh, make you think how these tools could be utilized to be integrated in your workflow. Um, and we will accomplish this using different exercises, all right? So the first step uh, of image segmentation is of course having the right kind of an image, okay? What does that mean? For example, if you want to look at just the nucleus, okay? And your goal is like, oh, well, let me measure um, the fluorescence within the nucleus or fluorescence within my mitochondria. You don't need to take high resolution images of your nucleus or the mitochondria, right? Because your goal is to measure total fluorescence within that area. If you were to take, let's say, high resolution image of nucleus, it's gonna look really big and it will also demonstrate or give you all this nucleoli kind of structures and some more definition that you may get within the nucleus. However, if you were to not image your nucleus at high resolution and high magnification as well, you will get nucleus which will look a little smaller and none of these definitions will be preserved, right? So let's say for example, if some of these definitions are preserved, the first step you have to do is something called image processing and filtering, okay? And we will talk a bit about all those processes and filters because your goal is to make sure that all these things that you look will, be, will look a bit blurry. So they all should be blurred out, okay? And that really facilitates with the segmentation process. And we will accomplish that using either Gaussian blur or median blur or mean and so on. So these are the uh, different process, uh, different filters in the processing tool that uh, we will learn about today. All right, so this is, uh, apart from that, when you acquire image, if you have some kind of background noise, how do we remove that, right? Yesterday, as I was uh, talking, you don't need to do background uh, brightness contrast and then hit apply to get that new image that looks like this. 
Rather, one would like to use rolling ball subtraction to make sure that uh, something, for example, you can see the noise over here, or if there is some noise also in the background, if you were to use rolling ball subtraction, it's no longer there, right? Um, and we will see some of the other examples as well. And from there on, again, the mitochondria has some definition over here, but then if you want to apply this as your label to segment your entire um, cell, you can apply something like Gaussian blur and then um, get detail out of your entire cell, okay? So uh, this will start make you think how to apply some of this process and filtering tools in your own workflow. Um, thresholding, once you figure out, get that nice blurry image, the next step is to threshold your image, something that we looked at yesterday and we will be again looking uh, on this today. You create a mask once you have thresholded something, but you might get into situations where objects are close enough to one another, right? Once, if the objects are close enough to one another, how do we separate them? And uh, that's where some of this other uh, filtering tools, for example, erosion, dilation, watershed, they come into picture. So we will also um, look at uh, some of these filters as well, okay? And that helps you get a nice binary image with individual objects. Um, once you have all those objects that you require, you can set measurements and get uh, values for different parameters or different metrics that you desire. And the same thing, and that's pretty much it, right? And once you have all these values, you can plot them using Excel or whatever your favorite graphical tool is, all right? So first step, uh, we will start from where we ended yesterday, kind of go ahead and repeat what we did yesterday, which is segment and analyze the nuclei. So we have this nucleus dash gray dot diff image. We will threshold the image. And uh, another way to know kind of what is the right thresholding region to start and end with is if you look at the histogram, you have your min and max, and you can start with that, right? Because you want to get all the uh, values which are part of your sort of this gray pixels. Once you threshold it, you can create you can binarize your image through process binary convert to mask. Um, and we will look at the analyze particle tools again, right? So Stoyan talked about this yesterday. You can turn on all of these options over here, for example, display results, add to manager and so on. And I know some of you had issues yesterday with this. Uh, so I wanna make sure that we are on the same page because we will be using this a lot today, okay? And once you get the ROI manager, we will play a bit more with the ROI manager, learn how to save. I don't think uh, you ended up saving your ROI manager files, but this is extremely important in making sure that there is reproducibility in future if you want to go and do something else. Now, everything that we are looking over here in terms of metrics, this is giving the metrics in terms of size and shape. But if you want to measure the fluorescence intensity, right? We cannot measure the fluorescence intensity of binary image because it's zero and 255. So we have to overlay this um, in, within the ROI manager onto our original image, right? So we will do that step, the next, and then get the intensities of all the nuclei over here, all right? So let's go ahead and start with this and let us know if you have any questions. This is kind of important for rest of the workshop today, okay?
All right, so let me walk you all through this exercise so that you kind of uh, get the idea of why we are binarizing things, which was the question. So the first option is uh, to open the shift control T, the thresholding uh, option. We will threshold our nuclei out, just make uh, a nice thresholding effort to get that, apply that. It's now thresholded. Uh, so when I say it's thresholded, it means it's binarized image. Um, everything over here is either zero or 255, right? So my background is zero, my foreground is 255. Oh, wonderful. Are we having dual screens? Let's do duplicate. Wasn't it this one over here? What was your option to share the screen? It's, is it? I think it's sharing. Yeah, it's sharing, okay. Don't think it appeared. Okay. Okay, we'll redo this. So open the file, shift control T, the threshold menu. Um, get a nice uh, threshold over here. And we will select the objects so that uh, all of them are appearing well. I'll apply the threshold. So now we have the background and the foreground that I was talking about a bit earlier. So that it has values of either zero or 255, right? There is nothing in between. Once we have that, we will uh, analyze the particles and we can analyze the particles based off of uh, pixel units or the size. Um, in this situation, the size will work. That's because uh, the metadata itself shows that there is certain size over here, right? But if you do not have uh, any metadata associated with your image, you can turn on the pixel units and uh, you can set your parameters or either way you can do it with pixel units as well. Um, there are some of the other options over here, which is circularity. Um, if whether you want something which is more circular or less circular. So one is more circular, zero is less circular. Um, and of course you want to add everything uh, to your ROI manager and turn on display results. And if I click OK, um, it ends up showing a screen like that with results of the area. If you look at the mean of all the images of all the objects, it's 255, right? Which pretty much means uh, that's not right. That's not the right fluorescence and density. But the cool thing is we have individual objects over here. And as I go down each of the object number, you can see them getting highlighted in uh, cyan color on the image, right? Okay, so now the question is, how do we get the intensity of the original objects that we have? So we can open uh, our original image, go back over here, and we already have the objects uh, in our ROI manager, right? And if I, go to my ROI manager and go down. Now it's showing me all these objects, right? So that's the best part of ROI manager. You can save something somewhere, open the same object in your original image now, and we can select all of them. Okay, shift, select all of them. 
and some measure. And that gives us, let me close the original measurements. And this gives us uh, the mean for all the nuclei, okay? So that's what uh, we were missing early on. Does that make sense to everybody? That's the mean fluorescence intensity of the nuclei over here. No, it should not be because 255 was binarized, right? This is from the actual image. Is somebody scheduled to come in this class? Do you want to, do you want to ask those guys? Uh, it will come up by itself. So let's close everything. Right. E absolutely. And this is exactly what we will be doing later today and much more tomorrow. Okay. So to your question, I select all of them and hit measure and the window just pops up. Okay. Telling you what is the mean standard deviation, so on for each of your object. Now, how can you control what you are seeing in the results window? Um, that's under analyze and set measurements. And everything that is uh, check marked in this window is what shows up. Let me cancel this, is what shows up over here, okay? So that's how you can control um, the number of columns that you want uh, for your measurements. Does that make sense? Okay. So, you know, in older days when people don't know how to do this, you'll be like, oh, let me just draw an ROI over here and, and measure that. So, you know, you would just go around and do this kind of stuff, the funky stuff, and then select measure, not so many of them. I'm really bad at drawing. Integrated density means, let's say you have all this pixels within the image, right? So these are all pixels. Um, right now, what we are saying is, give me the mean of all of them. Integrated density will mean, you are adding all these pixels. So it's summation of all these pixels within the object. Okay. All right. So are we good with this example? Awesome. So we mentioned yesterday, we'd also cover just a bit about filtering. Um, and Gaurav introduced that in part when he went over the process of analyzing data. We have capture and then pre-processing and filtering. And I'll go over a few of the more common filters that you can apply with Fiji um, and that are generally good for um, most kinds of data analysis if you have the right type of noise. Not every filter um, analyzes, or not every filter changes an image in the same way. And each of them has a best kind of noise or best kind of enhancement they can provide. So it's useful to be um, mindful about that. Hmm. Uh, something I wanna note very uh, strongly is when you capture a data set, that data set includes 
a signal, it includes noise, it includes everything your machine saw and imaged. So anytime you do something like casting downward from a 16-bit image to a 12 or an 8-bit image, as I mentioned yesterday, loses some data. Filtering um, is the same way. It can enhance a signal, but it will remove some of the data. Some of that data may be part of other signals you're not so interested in, or it could be noise, or more commonly, some combination of the two. So um, in conclusion, always keep your raw data, whatever kind of analysis you do. One of the basic components of a filter is the kernel. And while we are going to just graze against mathematics, I promise none of you will have to do any arithmetic here. Uh, that's what Shiji is for. So a kernel essentially is a way for Fiji to know which pixels to modify in an image. Normally a filter is applied pixel wise. That is at every pixel inside of an image is manipulated in some way by the filter to change its value based on its neighbors. The kernel essentially then tells the filter or tells Fiji how to change those pixels. This is a three by three kernel here. So it will affect the pixel of interest, of interest and will consider its nearest, uh, nearest neighbors, nearest eight neighbors around it. The identity kernel up there um, is a kind of trivial filter. If you apply it to an image, it won't change the image at all. Um, it's just for an example. This is the math that goes into calculating a kernel and convolving, convolving a filter with an image. And all that word means convolving is applying that filter to the image. This is the mathematical process. Fiji does it. These um, numbers right here are shown in matrix or in matrices. This is not typical matrix calculation, matrix multiplication. Um, but the example here is if we want to apply a Gaussian filter to one pixel, Gaussian filter is a type of filter that smooths out structures in an image, we would essentially um, apply this kernel to the pixel of interest and its neighbors and get some new value for that pixel. Yes, exactly. Um, there is a bit clearer example, actually. This website here has a pretty good visual example of how kernels are applied. So yeah, if you're looking at uh, the pixels here, that central pixel will then be changed depending on its neighbors. Is that clear? Does that answer your question? And you would, yes, do this for every pixel in the image, even at the corners. So you can see at the top corner here, we've only got the central pixel of our kernel and then the bottom three, because that's all that's available. All right, so I talked a bit about the Gaussian filter. It tends to smooth out structures and um, tends to make the image more homogenous. If you were to run a Gaussian filter over an image over and over again, eventually it would look like a normal distribution. So you'd have all the structures blocked away. A median filter, um, is very good at removing salt and pepper noise. I'll show you an example of what that looks like in the next slide, but essentially it is good at removing very tiny variations, um, various uh, individualized pieces of noise from a data set in instances where you might have particularly noisy instrumentation. And a top hat filter is 
almost like a median filter in reverse. That is, it um, filters out larger structures um, preferentially initially. And we'll see how that works as well. So here are some visual examples of those filters. The, there is a lot of salt and pepper noise in this image here, as we call it. So we see there's a lot of points. Those can very strongly, okay, thank you. Those can very strongly um, affect segmentation algorithms or analysis algorithms, particularly in cases where we don't specify uh, parameters like size or circularity to filter out all these noises. But you can see an application of the median filter removes that almost completely. There is some degradation in the structures in the center, but a median filter is very good at preserving edges, boundaries, such as between the cells and the background. The Gaussian filter here, you see its application um, removes some of the structure, it kind of spreads it out, but at the same time, it creates a more homogeneity inside those structures. So as Gaurav mentioned, if we wanted to say, be able to threshold this entire nucleus, uh, a Gaussian filter would remove that internal structure and make it more easy for us to segment that. Finally, the top hat filter here, um, is kind of a reverse in terms of the structure that removed. So we see uh, the bottom image compared to the top. All of the large structures are gone, leaving just small structures of interest in this case. We've got uh, one example for you all to go through. Uh, for you all to go through, but let me first show you on the screen. Exactly. Is that coming up? Yes. Exactly how to apply these filters. Hmm. Exactly how to apply these filters from EG. So we have got the noisy image here. In this case, actually, the central structures are obscuring our smaller signal, our smaller structures of interest. So if we go to process filters top hat, we can then click preview to see what it would look like. And we can alter the radius of that, um, of the filter. What that will determine is the larger the radius, the larger the structure the filter will leave behind in effect. So we see at one pixel, it removes all of those large nuclei. At 10, they're back. And the larger it is, the less it will affect the image. Between, yeah, between 20. And the default image, there's practically no difference at this point. Um, something to note, aside from the preview tick, if you filter an image that is irreversible. So duplicate or make sure you have a saved example on your hard drive. The Gaussian filter choice works similarly. You've got a single input, which is basically how large or how significantly it will smooth out the image. So the larger this value, the smooth the image will be. See the difference between one radius and 10. And finally, the median. Similarly, it has one parameter to input the radius. And that radius, as well for the Gaussian, as well for the top hat, is the size of that kernel. How far away from the central pixel does it apply its uh, mathematics? So go ahead and take a few minutes and go through this exercise. Uh, if anyone has questions, just raise your hand.
So, so far, um, we talked about thresholding in the terms of doing um, things manually. Um, and, but this is not the case all the time. Um, in cell profiler, for example, what we'll be using, it will tell you, hey, what kind of a thresholding option you want to use. And if you were to talk to somebody who is a computer or, or a vision scientist, they will tell you, oh, well, tell me what kind of thresholding you used, right? And at that time, you'll be like, oh, well, I thresholded based on intensities. Now, that is really arbitrary, right? So how do you make sure and what would you put in your publication when it comes to something like that? So under threshold, uh, we go with by default, but if you were to pull that tab down, there are plenty of other options that you will find. Uh, for example, ISO data, Lee, mean, uh, minimum, or one of the most popular is OTSU filtering. Um, and what we want you to do is try out all these different filtering options and figure out which one is best for you, right? So if we were to take the nuclei and we were to try different um, thresholding options, this is what we get. For example, with OTSU, this is what we get with uh, Wang and so on. So if you just want to try out what works the best, um, this is pretty fantastic, right? Now this is, so for each of this uh, thresholding filters, there are papers for each of them. They use a different methodology to extract the best possible thing, right? Um, and, and and that's why it's good, which is to say, oh, I use Otsu. And if you, if you think that all your objects or, or everything that you want in terms of intensity is becoming one object, that's all you care about. It doesn't matter what you are using. All you care is whether or not you are getting an object out of your, um, out of your particles or your um, organelles or your structures. Okay. Uh, one of the things uh, that I also talked about was before in between the image and the thresholding is something called background subtraction. Okay, and we will see how this matters as we move to the next slide. So, for example, if we look at the original image, uh, this is what we are having. Uh, if we use the background subtraction method, which is essentially a rolling ball radius method and we use background subtraction of 10, and we look at the histogram, it is pretty much preserved, except that some of these high values are taken out, but it's not altering the slope of the log distribution of your histogram. However, you compare that with some of the other ways you can make your image look very similar to what I have over here, uh, I can subtract the pixels and say, hey, you know what? Now my image does look like that. But then you can look at the histogram, it's completely altered. Same way, if you were to um, change the brightness contrast and save that, that histogram is super duper weird, right? There are lots of uh, regions in which the pixels are just chalked off with whatever uh, resetting and saving in brightness contrast does. So just uh, to, to just for you to appreciate that when you want to do any kind of subtraction of the pixels from the background, and we did a good job in cleaning out all this stuff from the nuclei, right? It also does a great job, uh, for example, with tissue images. When you have tissue images and you get lots of background data, I think uh, you were asking yesterday that you do imaging and there is always some background. Try out this method on some of your images. You'll be like, wow, my images look amazing after that, okay? So what we will do is we will take our original image, which is the nuclear image, and that's in So that's part of uh, crop composite and duplicate and only get the third image out of it, which is the nuclear image, which is the mitochondrial image. Okay, so we have this, I'll again duplicate this so that 
uh, I have this image in case I want to try something else. All right, once we have uh, this image, we will try, and if you think that you don't like the magenta color, change that to gray. That's all cool. And we will apply the rolling mode subtraction on this image. To find that filter, uh, just type in subtract. And uh, you want to choose the first one, which is subtract background filter. Um, and that's something which does the rolling ball subtract. Okay. And if I run, it's going to ask me what kind of a rolling ball radius do you want? Okay, and you can click preview over here to see how it's functioning. Uh, the larger the size, the lack of filtering it does. So if I have 50, it did not make much of a difference versus if I have this as 10, um, it made quite a bit of a difference. All right. So um, I'm happy with this. I'll say OK. And if I do one, it's going to remove pretty much everything. It will give you really, really nice and fine edges. OK. So uh, filtering is really a powerful tool um, in terms of what you want to show and what you want to represent from your data. But I'll keep this, I'll keep this at 10 and say, OK. Um, the other subtract that you had over there, I'll duplicate this again. And uh, let's look at the other subtract one. So that's under process, math, and subtract. So let's go through that. Process, math, subtract. And that is simply going to subtract 25 out of every single pixel. Right? So whatever value a pixel has, which is a 25, it's going to subtract that value. So let's just for the hype of it say 100. And nothing is happening. That's because it's a 16 bit image. And if I let's look at the histogram of the original image, uh, much of the bright pixels are somewhere over here. And that's why uh, I did not see any change. So, right, the minimum value is 178. So, if I, if I was to apply um, a value of 100, nothing will happen. So, let me go and do this again, process, math, uh, subtract, and apply a value of uh, 1,000. And now you can see a small change happening. I'll probably go ahead and apply 5,000, and you can see a large change happening, right? So it all depends on uh, what is the intensity of the pixels within your image. That's what it matters to begin with. If this was an 8-bit image, uh, if, if I was to apply 255, everything will become black, right? Because an 8-bit image has a range of 0 to 255. Okay. So just figure out what is the pixel intensity of your image. So I can say, OK, you know, it's kind of OK, that's fine. Uh, so let's look at the histogram of both these images. So that's over here. If we look at the histogram of the rolling ball subtraction, that looks like this. And this is the histogram of our original image, right? So clearly, using rolling ball subtraction, um, you preserve much of your data, whereas if you try to subtract with anything else, you don't preserve your data as much. So I would let you play with it, uh, and then we can go to the next step. subtraction will use a kernel filter which will go over every single pixel that is handled and rolling off is 
Just subtract ten thousand from each of them. Whereas rolling or subtraction applies a kernel uh, from the time chart of the pixel, which is ten ten pixels wide, um, and does the math for your speed. So just type in some stuff. and the third channel is not complete. Just to use the modifier to make it look like it's the third channel. So Mr. Ang, this question was um, the way that a kernel of the time chart His question was, does this represent the way of regular time chart? If a bunch of background noise and it increases in the noise ratio, it, 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 does it use the same kind of math? It, I don't think so. It uses the same math.
what you mentioned is partly correct. Um, it does not do a complete suppression of the background, but it can do a decent amount of filtering the screen. Um, if you look at it, you can actually see the difference.
So once we have um, all these images, um, let's see on what kind of an image thresholding works the best, right? So I'm gonna convert um, this to an eight bit image. Uh, the reason being, I want to demonstrate uh, the threshold option where you can get all this variety of uh, thresholding uh, to see what works the best, okay? So let's, uh, the way to do that is to go under image, uh, adjust an auto threshold. It will open up uh, this version, but it tells you it works best only on eight bit images. Um, and that's why I'll be converting this uh, to an eight bit image. Okay, so image type eight bit, this is my original data. This is uh, the subtraction with rolling ball radius. So I'm gonna convert both of them to eight bit and uh, go to image uh, adjust. Uh, auto threshold and say, okay, right? So this is what we got with the original image in terms of various automatic uh, algorithms available out there. And for something where the background was, sub background was subtracted, uh, image adjust auto threshold, say, okay. Uh, this is the difference, right? So um, it does much better job for many of the uh, algorithms out there when you apply background subtraction, okay?
So uh, let's move on to the next one, which is the uh, I want to introduce to another tool called BioVoxel, and you can uh, download this plugin. You can download this plugin from the update site and search for BioVoxel, um, and it's a fantastic toolbox because it lets you. Uh, figure out a bunch of different things. I mean, you pretty much have the same thing, area, extent, parameters, so on and so on in Fiji, but uh, the website tells you exactly what each of this means if we have forgotten our geometry, right? So area that means this, uh, extent, parameters, so on and so on. And all of this could be used in different ways. For example, if you are doing some cancer research and you are treating your cells with a bunch of drugs, what we do is uh, treat them either with radiation or with chemotherapeutics. Some of the cells will die, some of them will become resistant, some of them will keep on growing, they will change their size, they will change their shape. Um, we don't measure all these parameters um, on our cells. There is so much of hidden information right there for you to extract. And from the same data set, you can have many more graphs coming out. Okay, so instead of just saying, hey, I'm labeling with a, a with some kind of a probe that looks at cell death or, or cells are dying or not, um, you can do a lot of measurements on that. And uh, let's quickly look at some of the nice features about this plugin. So I'll, I'll again open the crop composite image. Um, let's say I already have my nucleus. So I'll just use that and I'll threshold it. And on my thresholded image now, I can open, open up the BioVoxel toolbox. Uh, it will open up as this um, green colored square. Um, and here uh, you have extended particle analyzer. So in Fiji, we had it, but the only separation we could do is based off of area, which is it's going from zero to infinity. But here you can, uh, exclude things based on many parameters, okay? So what do you want to study? So let's say, for example, um, I want to look at things which are uh, 10 pixels to infinity uh, or probably 20 to infinity. So I start excluding few things and say, okay, add uh, those things to the manager um, and say, fine, right? So it generates a mask. We also got um, all this different ROIs, which we which we got with Fiji as well before. But now the interesting thing you can do is look at things uh, using, ah, this is inverted. using shape descriptor maps. And it's going to generate this panel which shows you uh, different objects which are based off of the area, which one has got greater area, parameter, and so on, right? So it gives this nice uh, uh, lookup table uh, to help you. And you know we can use what we learned yesterday and say, hey, I want to look at this as my montage of images, label slices, um, let's say live to live width of two borders over there and say, okay. And uh, we end up looking at something like this where we know which cell has got more area or less area than the other, right? So this is really helpful for somebody uh, doing cancer research treatment, uh, treating your cells with something, uh, 
uh, looking at the area of the cells and so on, okay? So how the population is changing over time. Uh, it can be very informative. So in the biovoxel, let me, come on, okay. In the biovoxel, use the shape descriptor maps. So you go to help, update Fiji, and there under list of update sites, um, you select the biovoxel, you select the biovoxel, if it lets me go down, all right. Select the biovoxel update site. So both biovoxel and biovoxel 3D box. I, let me close it. So you go under help, update. It will update Fiji. And then manage update sites. And that will bring you to all this lists. Okay. So we will take a break for 10 minutes. You guys can work on this if you want to work on this or um, get freshened up. Um, we'll reconvene at 5.10. Okay, does that sound good? Yeah.
What's that? The third one? So I would click over here. I think there is an easier way. If you know, yeah, yeah. I will open up this menu. And then from there, the ship descriptor maps. Okay, walk it. All right, so uh, we will move on and work on some of the other problems, which is we have been working with simple nuclei so far. And you are like, damn, you know, we are tired of looking at nuclei. Now, an image is never going to be ideal. Uh, there will always be some issues that you might get in the image, right? So uh, you, you may be in a situation where where you have um, an image and there is all this crud like structures coming up. You know, you did immunofluorescence and you're like, damn, you know, I have all this crud like structures. Um, that's okay. If your goal is to analyze something which is larger, um, we can use different ways to only look at the larger structures. Okay. So, what we will do in this situation is we will um, threshold, we will try to threshold the image while we are thresholding you will see that there are still some of the smaller structures appearing, but then in the process and filters, we can remove that, okay? So let's uh, play with that a little bit. And there are also different, uh, bin different tools under binarization um, that one can play with. So let's uh, play with this a little bit. So I'll open uh, the image from here, which is nucleus. The name gray. I'll duplicate this because I always keep on going to my main folder to open things. Somehow it's stuck at one pixel. Okay, now it should be okay. Right, so you can try to um, get most of the nucleus over here, but let's say you still got some of this crud in the background um, and you want to look at just the nucleus, how do you end up doing? This is actually too much that I did. Uh, that's not gonna help my purpose. So I'll try this again. and hit apply. So now I got some of the structures in the background. I'll duplicate this just in case. And we can try different processing tools, for example, process and say, um, go down to filters and apply a minimum of certain things, right? So when we try to apply minimum of something to it, what it will do is it will reduce everything by two pixels, right? So if you have something over here that looks like this, the new image will be shrinked by two pixels, okay? So it will look something like this. But in this situation, if you have smaller structures, the curd like structures, they will disappear completely, okay? So that's one way of dealing with this. Uh, the filter, other, another filter is maxima filter, just like this, instead of reducing the size, it's going to 
expand out and your structure will grow and look bigger okay so we will come up to like very specific examples where this could be used later on but let's say we are applying one of this and we are saying okay i'm happy with this now the question is i know that this are individual nuclei except for this nuclei which is connected right so how do we separate connected things and the way to separate connected things is using an approach called connected component analysis all right under uh, so watershed is an example of connected component analysis you can go under uh, binary and use watershed so that's an example of connected component analysis and what you would see let me bring this a bit more towards right what you would see is um, it should break away this connection over there. Uh, that will only happen if there is good enough of an edge between uh, two cells. So let's see if that edge is good enough or not. All right, so I'll go to process, binary, uh, watershed, and it separated these two cells over here, okay? So before, uh, this is how it looked like. Let me zoom in. That's how it looked like. And after watershed, now we are separating the two components, right? So connected component analysis. Um, we are separating the two connected components, okay? So now it's a unique object versus uh, the object being together. Good. So these are uh, some of the examples that we have and we will apply the same kind of logic to our third exercise but before we do that i would like you all to play with this uh, let me also show one more way of excluding what we just did so let's say we go back to this image we still have some crud over here and we want to exclude that from image analysis. Uh, when we go to uh, analyze and uh, analyze particles, we can select uh, the size of whatever we want, right? So I can say, I want something from uh, 30 to infinity, right? And that's going to only show me uh something which is big so now if you want to measure um, anything of the larger objects you just you only get the larger objects so it was the 30 pixel was still not sufficient to exclude these guys out so i can increase my uh, range So I can increase my range to let's say something like 90 um, and do that. And now I've excluded all those smaller curd like objects. Okay, so though your image looks dirty in terms of analysis, you can exclude all these things out. The same way uh, somebody asked us the question in our session one, uh, they, there were a few people from neurobiology and they said uh, they have this uh, nuclear synaptic bouton like structures and they want to exclude the larger structures out right so if you want to do that you can still do that so let's close this out and uh, analyze analyze particles and instead of going from 90 to infinity i will just go from um, zero to something like 50, okay? And if I do that, I will only get my smaller structures that I will be analyzing in this mask. So you're not analyzing anything which is part of this larger structures, okay? So this the, the way you exclude things is very powerful um, to figure out the objects that you really want to analyze intensity or 
or diameter or shape or size of. All right. All right. So I'll let you all play with this. Uh, take five minutes or so, and then we will move to the next exercise. Let us know if you have any questions. You have.
that's one of the first reasons we always want to use study um, let's say we take the active ones we apply the cleanness of Python on it we make it much more clear and then it works otherwise we would get like nice brownies on that if we were doing something nice on Python Let's try to do that and see how that works. So there is a limit in All right, so we'll go through the nuclear membrane analysis part. And the goal here again is to identify uh, the intensity of the nuclear membrane. And it's the first thing that would come to your mind is let's open up uh, the image with nuclear membrane and threshold it. So let's see how that looks like. I'm gonna quit my Fiji for the moment. There's so much open over here. Looks nice. Go back to my folder. I'll open the nuclear membrane. Uh, there are two channels over here. Okay, uh, let me duplicate one of my channels. That's a nuclear membrane. Okay, now it looked very nice uh, in the merge, and you would be like, oh wow, it's, it's, I can only see nuclear membrane. But now you can see there is so much in the background that. Uh, that it's difficult. Let's say if I was to try and uh, threshold it. Uh, and let's see how well of a threshold we get only in the nuclear membrane, right? So if we try to get something for one of the cell, uh, we cannot get that for the other cells because all of them have got different intensities of, of the nuclear membrane protein as well as different intensities of how non-specifically this antibody is binding to the structures within the nucleus, okay? So how do we solve the problem? Well, we go and use our nuclear channel. And in the nuclear channel, in the nuclear channel, we will pretty much do what we did before which is thresholded. Shift command T, shift control T, sorry. Yep, 
All right, so we threshold it as nicely as possible, but also making sure we are not over thresholding it. So if we are happy with uh, something like this, um, we can say okay and apply. Now you would see that this cell uh, is not completely filled up. There are some gaps in them. So to fill up those gaps, we can use, that's I'm duplicating this, we can use this option, uh, process binary fill holes, okay? So that's gonna go ahead and fill all this tiny holes which are present uh, in some of this cells over here, okay? So let's go ahead and use that process binary uh, fill holes and those holes get filled up, all right? And from here on, let's say if your goal is to uh, I'm going to duplicate this. So your goal is to simply get the nuclear membrane. So let's uh, think for a second what's happening over here. Uh, this is your nucleus. Your nuclear membrane channel is just outside the nucleus right here. So one thing we can do is apply that expansion feature, right? Process uh, and maxima. So I'll probably apply the maxima of two pixels or one pixel or three pixel. We'll start with uh, maxima of two pixels. We will apply that and that's going to be my new image. And that's why I duplicated this image and now the second image we can use the option of subtracting two different images, okay? So then I'm going to subtract my image number two, which is with maxima of two pixel. Uh, like I'm gonna subtract my original image from the new image, which has the maxima of two pixels, okay? So I've got, uh, I'll be getting this new image over here. I'll be subtracting the first one uh, from the second image. So. Let's have a look at that, how that's going to work out. So let me apply a process, binary, uh, maxima, oh, sorry, filters um, and maximum. And let's say it's going to expand something and I'll just use one pixel for the moment. Okay. So it's gonna expand things and say, okay, I'm happy with this. I can then go and do image mathematics, which is use calculator, sorry, image calculator. And that can let you do uh, math on the entire image. So I will uh, use my second image, which is nuclear membrane 2-2, which has the expanded nucleus. And I will be subtracting uh, my first image uh, from this and say, okay, right? So now I got this nice membranes over here, okay? But we also want to make sure that this membranes overlap with uh, with our actual uh, cell data, right? So I'll again, go back to my original data right over here, uh, duplicate, my second channel and let's create an overlay of that. So image, color, merge channels. And I want to merge the nuclear membrane three and the uh, result of the nuclear membrane two and see how it looks like. Yeah, sure, you want the same bit depth? I'll give you the same bit depth. Okay. 
All right. So we can zoom in and make sure and toggle between channels to make sure whether or not this nicely overlaps to that of uh, where the nuclear membrane in fact is, right? So probably one of this guy. So it nicely overlaps on the nuclear membrane, okay? And we can utilize this mask um, to figure out the intensity of the nuclear membrane and so on. And this kind of techniques can be applied to other situations as well. So for example, let's say you might find when you are zooming in that there is some gap over here, right? So we are seeing a teeny bit of a gap over here. So how would you resolve something like that? So you can do a subtraction first of a pixel or so, instead of maximizing it, do a subtraction, uh, and then enlarge it by two pixels, and then try to do subtraction from the original data set, right? So there are different ways you can do this math uh, to get uh, the right kind of a bending pattern of your nucleus. Uh, so there are some problems up here, the way I have put it, which is, hey, what will happen if you were to you know, uh, use something else instead of uh, two, you, if instead of one, you were to use two, right? So it, the, the bands are a bit more thicker. You are expanding it more from where your nuclear membrane is, and that may not work really well. And that's why you probably want to use a filter of one. What I also did not show, and I was hoping one of you would comment and critic me saying, hey, you did this, but uh, this cell does not look good, right? It has got all this, extensions coming out, that's because uh, to begin with the image had some issues with it. So for example, this image has lot, a lot of background. So one of the ways which Stoyan mentioned is you can use a bunch of filters, for example, median filter. A median filter is an edge preserving filter. And remember, uh, the nuclear membrane is an edge-like structure. So we want to preserve the edge of the nuclear membrane. So if I was to use uh, the median filter, which is what I recommend you to use for this example uh, over here, right? So, and then try out what would happen if you were to use a mean or a Gaussian filter. These are not edge-preserving filters, okay? So let's... Uh, uh, use the median filter in this situation this time. So process, filters, uh, median, and three. Right, so it removes a lot of that background that we were getting before. And if I was to uh, do the same thing that I did in terms of finding the edge, uh, this will be much more cleaner than, than what I had before, okay? So in nutshell, uh, you can, once you know how different filters are working, you can apply them in different combinations on your image um, to get information out of the desired structure. Make sense? That's kind of the take home message I wanna to give to you over here. So I'll let you practice this for like five, 10 minutes. Let us know if you have questions. I can keep on talking more and more, but once you get your hands dirty, um, that's when questions come up. And I think that's when we can come and help you more. So we have two channels in that image, right? One is the nucleus channel, one is the nuclear channel. So go to um, cross. 
So uh, I'm coming to that. If I close all my images, I'm removing everything I didn't need. She was perfectly saying the same things on the library so I said yeah, yeah, yeah. all right so we are all at uh, this stuff and that's why in-person classes are awesome right people can talk to each other help each other out it's just fun all right so we are all at this stuff now the question is what is what what do we do with this is measure them as in objects and create those objects into ROI management um, and you can create a nice threshold very easily right because it's zeros and two can be twice so I have this threshold over here I'm going to apply that and particles and uh, zoom on the same right there all right so now I got each of this masks as individual individual objects and I can go back to my image over here. My goal is to measure the fluorescence of the or the sorry the fluorescence of the nuclear membrane. I can now go and select all these masks and click on measure, and that's going to give me the mean intensity or whatever intensity I want of the nuclear membrane. Does that make sense? So, so that was the reason of doing all the steps. So I'm also repeating what you can do with this function itself. Okay. All right. So in the interest of time, let's go to Zoom's page. Um, let's see. So, uh, yeah, we have lots 
of cultural textbook research. So, for much of the So uh, there is another way of doing nuclear member analysis. Uh, feel free to check out this YouTube video from Anna Klam. Um, she talks about a different way, which is create a band around the nucleus and doing it. So you will also end up learning some more if you watch this uh, YouTube video from her, okay? All right, so we promised you that uh, there is deep learning aspect to this course. And a lot of you would be like, oh, wow, it's deep learning. Let's attend this course. It's going to be fun. Sure, sure, it's fun, okay? Now, the problem that a lot of us have um, with nucleus is we are imaging tissues and nucleus are really nice and tight and the traditional thresholding method will not work over here, okay? So how do we do that? We can use Stardust for that. And then Stran will show you cell posts. And these are all deep learning based methods. What does deep learning means? It's a subset of artificial intelligence, okay? In which we end up using neural networks to analyze data. But this neural networks are uh, sort of, uh, models that you can train. And the way you train that is by having the training data. What you have to do is manually annotate all the training data. So let's say if you have lots and lots of cells and you, and you want to reject phylopodia, right? So we'll have raw data, which is the training data of your phylopodia. You will manually draw on the phylopodia, which is called the process of annotation. And then you will feed this data set into a deep learning model, which usually is a neural network. And this W and B, these are knobs and gears, which you keep on tuning, the, the parameters you keep on tuning till you end up getting something with your test data, which looks similar to the annotated data, right? So. This is, and then there is this human in the loop curation um, where you keep on changing these gears till you are satisfied that your test data looks similar to what you have annotated. All right. So, this is in nutshell what a deep learning model is all about. And once you create a deep learning model, you try to predict the um, intersection over union. Uh, these are an example of some of the deep learning models. This is two years old. At that time, um, Salpos or Stardust were not in the race, but so compared to Cell Profiler, which is more of a manual method, um, the other deep learning models did much more better in terms of their IOU score, okay? Uh, 
So in, when, when we are looking at segmentation, the goal is not just to say, wow, I am seeing a bunch of nuclei, but you want to say, you want to identify each of those nuclei from the bunch of nuclei. So that's the difference between the semantic and the instant segment, segmentation. In instant segmentation, you can identify number of nuclei versus in semantic, it's just nuclei, that's all you know. All right, so we will start with Stardust, um, which works really well. It's a UNAT-based model, again, a neural network-based model. It works best on star convex shape structures um, and does not work well on anything else, okay? So let's uh, go ahead and uh, look at this with one of the exercises. Uh, these are lung nuclei. What you are seeing are a bunch of alveolar structures over here. And clearly, by all means, if you want to try out um, segmenting this manually, be my guest, okay? Uh, do you think this will work out with manual thresholding? Not, right? So we will use Stardust and see how it looks like. So in Stardust, there are two different things which are really good that you need to know. Um, which you will be tuning most likely, the probability score and the overlap threshold, okay? As you increase the probability uh, and the score threshold, the number of objects that you detect will decrease. As you increase the overlap threshold, there will be overlapping on the same object. The so same object will appear multiple times if you increase the overlap threshold. Okay, so those are the only two parameters you need to know when you start doing things and you should be good. So did, did all of you um, download this plugin from the update site? Um, if not, you can do it now and, and we can uh, go onwards with that. So um, again, just to rehash. Yeah, same thing, go to help. And you need to da uh, da install two different things. One is the CSB deep plugin and second is Stardust. Okay, so you need to have both of them uh, for this to work. Help update. Manage update sites. Uh, and you would see here that I have got yeah, CSP deep. This one, CSP deep and Stardust. Okay, and Stardust. Once you um, add that, update uh, your Fiji and uh, things should be good. Okay. So I'm going to open my data set. And it's under deep learning, lungs nuclei. And we can start with the cropped area instead of the a large area. Right, so this is how it looks. And you can also kind of see that there is a little bit of uh, background from red blood cells interfering with uh, the images. So we'll go ahead, go down to plugins, um, all the way down to Stardust. And Stardust Studio. It will open up this dialog box, which I showed to you before. And uh, I'll keep my parameters as 0.6 and 0.5 um, in the probability threshold score. I don't want to over interpret something either and say, okay, it's gonna do its thing. Plugins, here, plugins, uh, scroll down to Stardust. What's that? Oh, yes, uh, thank you for asking that. You, you want to check ROI manager on Stardust, right? 
because you want to figure out how many nuclei you have and what kind of overlap you're getting. And we'll show you a step that we will be using for the images for tomorrow, okay? Yeah, just 2D. Sure, let me close this and, and go back over there. So open my image, plugins, Stardust 2D. And uh, one thing I did not mention is um, there are different models that the Stardust is trained on. And the one that we are using right now is for the fluorescent nuclei. If you all are having HNE images, this also works on HNE data pretty well. Just change the model to versatile HNE nuclei, okay? So that will work out well for you as well. Uh, coming down to the question, uh, this one over here, what you want to use. Yeah, 0 0.6 and 0 0.5. So remember how I said that if we increase this, we will get fewer nuclei. Um, it's at 0 0.6, I can try and do 0 0.7 and see how it looks like because I had enough nuclei at 0 0.6, but I can do 0 0.7 now. An overlap threshold of 0 0.5, that's okay. I don't want way too much of overlap either. And let's say, okay. Right, so. Let me, let me check again. I think I might not have explained that. Okay. Okay. All right, cool. Sure. Okay, so let me go back. Sorry, guys. Welcome. Plugins. So the option I have chosen over here is both and ROI position automatic, okay? Yeah, so you also want the output as a label image as well as your ROI manager. Okay. So once you get all this ROIs, I can kind of go um, to my original image and see where each of these ROIs are. Um, or I can actually say show all. Oh, come on. Okay. So you can figure out where each of these ROIs are on your image. And it, it does a great job. It's out of the box, you don't have to do anything. And now you can tell me why the hell you made us do everything we did before. Guilty as charged.
So you get the numbers by turning both labels as well as show all, all right, at the bottom. And let's say in this ROIs, uh, if you think that something is not right, you can double click and delete those ROIs as well. Sometimes if you feel the annotation is not correct. So for example, uh, you know, I'm not happy with this uh, small little thing, which is the 275th number. And I can double click over here. It comes right here and I can delete that. Okay. So that ROI is gone now. So uh, it is it is completely editable um, as you may. Now, the next step to this, let's say we do all of this and you want to analyze this. You know how to analyze very easily now. You have all this ROIs. Um, they are well overlaid on your nuclear data set. You can go and say measure and that gives you intensity of all your nuclei, okay? So Stoan will show you after this, the cell pose where it can help detect the cell itself. And you can get this ROI list, which means you can measure um, the cell intensity or anything which is inside the cell. You can, yeah. So you can save this as a CSV file, okay? And open in Excel. All right. Uh, what we also want to do is automate some of these tasks. You can have this uh, open in cell pose because tomorrow what we're gonna do is um, have our primary object, the secondary object and figure out the tertiary object, which is your primary is your nucleus, your secondary is your cell. And we will be doing a subtraction of the object, which is the cytoplasm, which is the cell minus the nucleus to figure out our cytoplasm, right? So if you have a data set with lots of crazy cell structures like this, we can create masks out of this and we'll show you how to create a mask out of it now. So you have this image with you, all right? Uh, what you want to know is the pixel dimensions of this image. So we'll create a new image with the same pixel dimension. So we'll go and say, file new, image, and that is going to be 654 by 636, okay? And we got a blank image of the same size. And now we have all this ROIs. I'm gonna select all of them, shift, select all, go to more and do fill. When I do fill, I got a mask of my image. Isn't that great? I'll do it again. All right. So we, the size of the image is right over here. Don't don't use the one in microns. Use the one in pixels. Okay. So we go to file, new, image. Um, type in over here, 654 by 636, say okay. We select all the ROIs in the ROI manager, okay? Go to more and then fill, boom, get all the ROIs. But is there something which looks not so right about this? They are touching each other? Right? How do we remove them touching each other by using? Awesome. Let's do watershed on this, okay? You guys are great. Process, binary, and watershed. Boom. We get individual nuclei just the way it should be. And if you want to make sure everything is looking okay, we can use this image and show the labels on top of it, right? And looks perfect. So I did this because we want to utilize this tomorrow when we use cell, cell profiler, okay?
because your image is inverted, uh, let me go and come and help you with that. All right, so Gaurav introduced you to uh, machine learning and deep learning. So CellPose is um, a very good um, deep learning way to segment your cells and data. These are variants, various uh, performance markers that compare CellPose to other methods of segmentation and identification. And CellPose scores very highly on This will be more of a demo um, than an exercise, really, because as you've all found, as many of you have found out, at least, it's tricky to get cell posts to work, and there's a number of problems. So I'll just take you through the uh, user interface here, and I can go ahead and open an image for us to segment. 
with it. So at the top under file load image, I loaded a TIFF file. This is a um, sample of liver. So it's actual tissue. So you can see the cells are very densely packed. Um, under the segmentation window here, you've got a cell diameter in pixels and a calibrate button. Um, this is a method internal to the software to kind of look at the structure of the image and identify typical size of the structures that you want to segment. Uh, you've got the reference circular cell down at the bottom just to kind of give you an idea. Um, we're going to use the suggested calibration method because that'll end up being around 60 or something pixels, and it works pretty well for this. Uh, but at any time, you can also enter in one by hand if you want to try different or try different uh, configurations. That's weird. Um, you'll see here, use GPU. Um, Selpos comes in at least two versions, um, one that uses the CPU to perform all the calculations, one that is able to offload some of that work to a discrete graphics card. Um, generally, if your workstation has a discrete graphics card, it's better to run it on that than the local processor. We can specify here the channels we want to segment, which are actually yeah, red for the nucleus, green for the cell cytoplasm. And we have these two sets of values that we can modify, the flow threshold and the cell probability threshold. Now that text is kind of small. So the flow threshold um, is the threshold and flow, flow error to accept a mask, set higher to get more cells, uh, lower to get fewer cells. And that runs from zero to, I believe it was, yeah, that runs from 0.1 to three are the ranges of appropriate parameters. This one, the cell, probability threshold uh, runs from minus six to six, which includes zero. So any of those parameters would be valid for this. And this, um, if set to lower, will include more pixels, higher will include fewer pixels. So you might lose or gain cells depending on that ratio. I believe last time Gaurav and I ran it, we had two and two. We can try it anyway. Um, which, as I think that to myself, is worth reminding you all, a deep learning algorithm that has been trained and has created a model will always yield the same results for the same image with the same parameters. And that's good. Um, but it also means you need to note down the parameters you're using so you can get the same result later on or modify it if you want to maybe get a different fit, maybe a better fit. The model zoo down here, uh, these are the names of various models that the people who've created cell pose have. Yeah. The model zoo. I don't know. I don't think so. There is, there should be an image in the uh, presentation that is a close up of that if you want to reference it. But basically, yeah, these are the models, the model zoo, that is different models that have been trained on different data sets, annotated data sets uh, for different purposes. Cyto is usually a pretty good one to start out with, especially if you've got you know, well-labeled nuclei. So once we've set our parameters, we can click on that and it starts to attempt to fit that data. The 
the process, the um, duration rather of the calculations depends on a number of things. Usually one of the biggest factors is the image size. Much larger images can take a uh, much longer time to process. But we can see that we've segmented the nuclei around the tissue. Oops. Good question. Because we're just uh, trying to get the nuclei here, it is counting some of the edge cells as well. That's a good question. There may be, uh, or you could do it after post application when you're analyzing it, you can say maybe any structure that is within so many pixels of the edge gets tossed because all of this information, in fact, when we go to file and save masks and image or save outline as text for image J, what that will do is that will save all of the ROIs cell post has generated um, into a file. Tomorrow, Gaurav will show you, or Gaurav and I will show you how to take those files, convert them for use in ImageJ, and then actually load the masks we generated with CellPose, the ROIs we generated with CellPose, and load it into Cell Profiler. And then the segmentation is done. All we have to do after that is apply those masks and figure out what we want to measure. So if I change to green, we can run that again. Yes, uh, what we can also do is if we right click somewhere on the image, we'll get this cursor, which will then allow us to shade in a complete area. If we noticed that the model uh, missed a cell that we want to include, conversely, we can also delete these sections, which is done with control left click. We can delete bad fits as we find them. Like these two, for example, they're not really meaningful. But let's alter our parameters. Let's include the red channel. We want to include maybe a few more pixels. And yeah, there are a fair number of moving parts in a lot of models like this, you saw two sliders with a uh, star disk. So when you are trying to figure out um, how useful a model or a deep learning application is for you, I would advise doing it relatively deliber deliberately like you would create an experiment. Uh, so keep changes to a minimum. I was not so responsible right now. I changed one parameter. I added a second channel and we're looking for different stuff now. So. We won't necessarily know which of those was most meaningful in getting a better fit.
So it fits some better, but it's still a pretty poor fit for all of these. Mm -hmm. Oh, the parameters, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What is That's a good question. So it it depends on the question you're trying to answer. Um, Imaris is very good for uh, cells, individual cells or small collections of cells. Um, it has some powerful tools, but it's licensed. This is open source. So that's one thing you can consider. Something else is um, if you got into deep learning with something like cell pose, eventually you can even train your own models that are specific to your work. Um, so if you annotate a set of images, train them on one of these platforms, then you would have a you'd have a more direct application of the output. And this is tissue, so we can try the tissue net model as well. Not anymore. Yeah, I already pressed. I didn't think it was too good. Did you have another question? I mean, I think that's it. Uh, all we can cover with cell pose. CP. This one? Mm-hmm. 